Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Jesus is Lord Ministries out here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I hope everybody had a, a great Christmas and celebrated the birth of Christ and and uh, just enjoyed family and friends and all the food, good food and stuff. I, sh I sure did myself. It was a uh, um, I got to start backing off a little bit and make a New Year's resolution like a lot of people do to, after all the cake and cupcakes and the candy and all that stuff. But it was it, it was a lot of fun. And I hope everybody really enjoyed their time of uh, time together. So um, it's great to be back behind the pulpit and Pastor Mike's church out here. So um, I'm going to. Um, Start out by saying my name is Rick. For those that don't know me, I'm praying we have new viewers regularly. As since there is three services a day at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. seven days a week, guys. So if you can take some time out of your day and check out all the other speakers and pastors that, that preach, uh, you know, you you should receive something from all the all this word of God being broadcasted out here from this church out here in Gettysburg. So um. The title of today's message is Humble Ourselves as a Little Child. And guys, we I hope we really receive from this today. Um I like I say like I always mention I really enjoy teaching and um I uh I question myself sometimes and I've shared it with you guys before. I'm just a retired machinist and you know, I'm not a pastor or preacher. You know, that's how I look at myself and I I sometimes question myself should I be behind a pulpit? teaching and preaching the word but i'll share something with you guys real quick this morning i i got a voice message on my phone and i looked at the time it was 4 a.m well this young man joseph sent me a voice message that tina and my wife and myself was on his heart that he felt like he needed to uh send me a message and just remember this is 4 a.m in the morning and uh, it turns out it was the kids or young man's name was Joseph. He it was a, a, a young boy that we taught in Sunday school probably 10 or 12 years ago. And it just so happens we came to his thoughts, you know, and he wanted to let us know how grateful he was and how and how great Sunday school teachers we were in this. It's just a it's just a beautiful little voicemail. And I'm I'm sharing that because. It really encourages encouraged me because we look. It's not how we look at ourselves; it's how Christ looks at us. If we we may look at ourselves like we're not uh, uh, we we're not worthy or we're not trained up enough, we're not capable. I'm not a public speaker and all these things, but we gotta, especially if you get an opportunity, to even witness to someone. Don't let your who you think you are get in the way just like I, I it was like a little wake up call to me i mean it was just a simple message from joseph you know he's probably in early to mid 20s now and uh because he was his fifth sixth, fourth fifth and sixth grade ministry back back then but just shows you the impact plus the power of the gospel to for something like that to to happen to a person so i thought i'd share that because i thought it'd be a good way to start out after christmas and um the the holy spirit moving and in, in our midst whether we see whether we are aware of it or not but um let me start out in prayer like always and and let's get the service started lord help us this day to pray from a humble heart as through the eyes of a child so we may walk out your will for our lives in these final days before your return in jesus holy name i pray amen okay guys if you got a bible or a bible app go to matthew 16 verse 24 and then we'll we'll move on for there we'll we'll read uh, matthew 16 24 to 28 then jesus said to his disciples if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his, save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing who, here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man 
coming in his kingdom. And there's a lot going on there right out of the gate. That is a lot going on here. And something that caught my attention, well, let, just just I'll back up to 27 and I'll and I'll just read. I'll read 27 again. For the Son of Man will come in his glory of his of his father and his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Works just means what did you do with this life that you were granted? Uh, from the beginning, when you're accountable and when you're, you know, old enough to get out and say even witness or get out and work in, amongst other people and 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 you were old enough to know right from wrong and 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 you were old enough to even what know what it means to love your neighbor and, and help other people, stuff like that. What did you do with this life? That, that's basically what and it's just it's it's termed co- according to works, but it's it's what did you do with this life? And here's the thing you, that caught my attention, verse 28, is I surely I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, to me, and you can study this out yourself or pray about it, and I feel like the Holy Spirit told me, uh, gave me a little revelation on that, that that means that you could be a rich man on this earth and think you've got everything going on you got your you got your house you got your 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 finances in order you got you you basically stored up your treasures on earth but he but when jesus when returns and this just call him a rich man to keep things simple stands in front of our lord and he's accountable for what this life that what did he do with this life that he had what was his works his works or is not not for the glory of God, but really for the glory of Himself. He's put all of his focus on his what what served him well. His riches, he stored up his riches on earth. So that's telling me he's not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that's my take on that, you know. And I prayed about it, and because when some scriptures either stand out to you, it's always a good idea to go back and go over them and pray for revelation on them, or go back and it may be something just personal, personally for you, or just for an understanding of it. And guys, if you if you pray about it and, you, and God can add to that, that's awesome. I mean, it's just something I feel that is, if it isn't, isn't, if it's not the perfect revelation on it, it I think it's a good place to start. Okay, guys, we're going to move on to chapter 17. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And I don't know about you guys, but this, to me, if anybody picks up this Bible, and it, or they claim that I've read the Bible once before because I've heard this being spoken to me myself, and I don't, I didn't get anything out of it or you know, I really didn't understand it. And, you know, or they, but how could you not see how exciting that is and how wild that is when we're, if you believe in Jesus and it's telling us in his word that he, he gathered up a few disciples and headed up on this high mountain and was transfigured. And these guys were mere men at this point. They were just retired or they used for fishermen and stuff like that. I would I I don't see how people could set, walk away from this word and not see how exciting this is. Um I thought I'd mention that verse 3 and behold Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with them then Peter answered and said to Jesus Lord is it good for us to be here if you wish let us make here three tabernacles one for you one for Moses and one for Elijah. Okay let me let's just understand it where we're at so far. Tabernacle is actually a tent used as a sanctuary. And honestly, I just uh, learned that recently because I always thought when I heard the, saw the word tabernacle in the Bible, honestly, I pictured like a, 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 a church with maybe marble pillars out in front and a, and a you know, just a heavy structure of, uh, you know, concrete and marble and all this stuff. But no, it's actually, I looked into it and it's actually a tent used as a sanctuary. So Peter's asking, you know, Lord, should we set up tabernacles for, you know, um, you know, the Moses, Elijah and, um, and uh, uh, sorry, t- tabernacles for you. 
Moses and Elijah and for Jesus. So um, I thought that was kind of cool. And um, okay, and a lot we all know. Um, okay, let me get too far ahead of myself here. Let me keep moving. I'm going to. I'm, I'm, sometimes I get ahead of myself. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, in who I am well pleased. Now, can, remember, this is a, these guys were fishermen. They were, they were just hooked up. This is Matthew. This is the first book in the New Testament. This is the starting of the disciples walking with Jesus. And this is the things that were going on in their lives. And you got it. The, the best you can put yourself in the in the place of Peter and these disciples, and they were experiencing these things, because that's what's going to stir your spirit up in you to get you and myself to where we need to be. To you know, we've got to believe what this book says. And if you're if you like uh, reading books, whether they're fiction or, or mysteries, stories, and all this, and you like books that are exciting. I, I think there's this would be a good book for for anybody to read. To, but the neat thing about this, this is this is truth. This isn't fiction. This isn't a made up story. And when and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. And can you imagine just being there, try to visualize this? But Jesus came and touched them and said, "Arise and do not be afraid." When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now, th now catch this in verse 9. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision, now he's calling it a vision, to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Now, can you imagine? These guys got to hold, they got to keep this to themselves. They experience the voice of God. They've seen these prophets, the Elijah, one of the greatest prophets that's ever lived, and, and they've got to keep this to themselves. And then he added to him until he is risen uh, from the dead. And that's just how wild this, 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 this story is. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Eli Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also put to, about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Um, I, that, that to me is really good. The way what I understand from that is the spirit of Elijah um, worked through John the Baptist. That that's my take on that. And again, you guys can um, look into these things um, real quick. Elijah was a mighty prophet who God used to turn the people of Israel from from false prophets of Baal and turn them back to the only only true and living God. So think about it. Uh, God used Elijah to turn the Israelites back around toward back to him. And he used John the Baptist and he and John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah in him to bring people to turn away from their sinful way of living and be and repent of their sins and and turn them back to the coming Messiah. And that's what I take from that. I thought that was um really really good and kind of uh, fits what the, how the story has started so far verse 14 and when they had come to the multitude a man came to him kneeling down to him and saying lord have mercy on my son for he is an epileptic and suffers severely for he often falls into the fire and often into the water so i brought him to your disciples but they could not cure him then Jesus answered and said, this caught my attention, too, because think about it. He, these disciples were walking with Jesus, seeing the power the, that was in him through the, the come from the Father in heaven. And they he's still talking to them. And and he said he he told these disciples that weren't, weren't, it wasn't Peter, John and that went up on the ma mountain with him. But the disciples that stayed off the mountain, this is what he said to, to him. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. 
And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. So imagine the disciples seeing everything that was going on. So they go to Jesus and they're like, then they, they had to ask Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast the, the demon out? They were they were like they were confused. Like, why couldn't we cast this demon out? So, so Jesus said, because of your unbelief. Now, listen to this. Remember, these are the disciples. These are the chosen 12. These are personally chosen by Jesus himself to follow him and be his disciples. And there and he's telling them because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But catch this in verse 21. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, let's pause for a second. He's telling them this is why you couldn't cast this demon out, because this, this particular demon could only be cast out by prayer and fasting. Now, think about that. Obviously, they couldn't start fasting and praying right there before they spoke to this demon to, to be to trying to cast this demon out. So what I take away from that is the, the disciples weren't fasting and praying continuously, no, no matter if they went up on the mountain with Jesus um, and, and seen the trans, see him transfigured and all these things that they were, they were left there at the bottom of the mountain. But they, to me, they weren't praying and fasting like they should have been up to that point. And that's why, and that's how they fell into unbelief where they couldn't cast this demon out. Now, guys, that's my take on it. Please, in your own time, when you read these scriptures, you pray and ask for um, understanding and revelation on these things. But that's what I walk away from that, the way it's, way it's written. Verse 22, now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of a, the son of a man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up and they were exceedingly sorrowful. Now, think about all the things we've already covered so far. Um, Jesus taking three of the disciples up on the mountain, and they experienced uh, uh, the, the, the prophets of old, and they were, they, fe they fell out in the spear. Basically, God, they heard the voice of God, and it, it's led up to this point now where they tried to cast a demon out once Jesus came back off the mountain, they couldn't cast a demon out. And Jesus is trying to, to uh, teach them, you know, the, the way they should be living by praying and fasting. Then they're approached by, and they, they, Jesus is teaching them all along, discipling them. And now they're being faced with him telling me, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, basically killed and raised and raised from the dead again. So you can only imagine being a disciple, what, how this, how their lives were and how everything was transpiring. For, and at, at last they think about, they had to be very sorrowful. Verse 24, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, now listen, this blows my mind because all this went on. And in that, and in order for us to understand, we got to try to walk through this and, and put yourself into these disciples' shoes and see what is actually going on. Now they're being confronted by tax collectors is what I'm way I'm reading it. And um, what, what they said was, I'll, I'll start again. When they came to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax or, or, or tax collectors came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Now, what? To me, it's looking like they're up to something. They're trying to catch him up in something. They're always trying to trip Jesus up or catch him. Like they think they're going to catch him off guard and, and he's not going to respond the proper way. But he said, yes, this is Peter talking to the tax collectors. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, because Jesus knows, knew all this was going to come, you know, and, and that's what else is kind of interesting to me sometimes it's like these these tax collectors actually thought in their the, the way they process their think thoughts that they could catch Jesus off guard well he already anticipated all this and um this is Jesus's words 
What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, least we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take out the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me. Now, let me see if I can get temple tax. Let's get, remember, it started back, back where these tax, tax collectors asked Peter, D does your teacher pay taxes, a temple tax? Well, a temple tax is required of Jewish men over 20 years of age to, to pay once a year for the upkeep of the temple. That's what the temple tax was for. But here's the interesting part. The sons of the leaders didn't have to pay a temple tax. Did catch that? The, the leaders of the temple itself did not, the sons of the leaders did not have to pay that temple tax. And that's, that's what this is talking about. But um, this is when it gets interesting to me. Jesus, think about it. The temple itself was God the Father, Jesus' Father's temple. That was so certainly he wouldn't have to pay the temple tax. Think about it. Even the sons of the leaders of the temple didn't have to pay a, a tax. So for sure, Jesus wouldn't have actually had to pay that temple tax because the temple itself is the father's temple. But at least he would offend them. That's why he told Peter to pay that temple tax. I hope I, I hope I was clear on that. OK, let's move on. Um, let me see where I'm at here before we get too far. Uh, yeah, look, that, I think we're gonna, we can move on to verse or chapter 18. At the time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I hope you guys are keeping up with all this so far, because now we're moving on to something else. I'll start again. At that, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? We're talking about the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, not on earth. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And gosh, that's huge. That's why I titled this Humble Ourselves as a Little Child. Because it's pretty clear here, and I'm going to read that again, because this is the kind of things that can, you can easily read over and, and not really meditate on it and ask for God, what do, exactly does that mean? But what it says clearly in chapter 18, verse 3. Well, I'll start verse two again. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in, in the midst of them, set a small child in front of everyone that was standing there. Surely I say to you, unless you are converted, converted would be changed from where the person you are now to, uh, to some, something else. It's, you're converted and become as a little child. You will by, by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. To me, even as he's talking to adults here, he's talking to the disciples. They're the ones asking the question, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, he's basically saying the way I, I would understand that is everything that you think you know, every all, it, it, all the education you have, the intellect you think you have, how well educated you are, you let all those things go, all those, because you know what? Even if you're a professor of science, it's still worldly things. It's not going to get you into heaven. That's no. That's not. That's not salvation. There. That's still ways of the world. That's what keeps earlier on when it said the the rich man will not enter in the kingdom of heaven because he stored his treasures up on earth. It's almost the same thing. You make yourself a god within your own thoughts and your own thinking. You you set yourself above other people. Say say you have a very high IQ and you become a professor of science or and technology. That's kind of things. That's basically what he's saying. But if you look at it that way, it's actually it's actually the simplicity of the gospel, because take all that out of the way, everything you think you know and th what you think you should know to be successful in this world and come to the just like erase the, all that from your from your your life and start all over again in the eyes of the Lord. That's humbling yourself. 
verse 4, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There's their answer. They wanted to know who is the greatest. Well, Jesus just laid it out for them. People that can just die to self. That's what it's basically saying. Die to self. Get yourself out of the way. Just clean your slate. Just wipe your slate clean as a child, the innocence of a child. Then you will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5, whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. We can, that's something you only, you got to really still meditate on in your quiet time to really understand what is exactly is Jesus saying here. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That's big. One thing you kind of got to remember, too, when you're talking about a child of God. Now, he actually had a small child in the midst of him when he was explaining who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But we're looked at as children of God, even if you're, you know, you're an older person, man or woman, you're you're still a child of God. So you don't discount yourself because you're grown. You you're still. But if you. If you steer a child, a small child away from or even a person in your in that you've interacted with and you and you take steer them away from God, it'd be better what you you're you've condemned yourself. You you're that's it you're worthy of death and not entering into heaven by take by taking a child of God, which could even be a grown up and steer them in the wrong direction. That's that's what I'm taking away from that. Woe to the world, and catch this, this is this is stuff to, to learn by and meditate on. Woe to the world because of the offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offenses come to the world. What caught my attention on that is the world, the worldly way of thinking. It's ungodly. It's, it's self-centered. It's um, all about me or all about what benefits me. You know, um, you, you're after riches. You're after fame. You're after you glorify you want your your treasures on earth your your the world doesn't teach love your neighbor as thyself and the, it seems to me even i keep up with the war in uh israel now in gaza and you see the hate of the of the um the terror organizations, they're taught to hate just the opposite of walking in the kingdom and following Jesus. He talks, to, he teaches love and put your love your neighbors as your as thyself. And the world, which is Hamas, is one of these ter- terrorist groups, they teach to hate. They don't even look out for their own people. The in the news they describe them as using their own people of Gaza as human shields. So that's the world, though. Where did it come from? It, you know, it's either he, it's like a demonic spirit versus a a heavenly spirit or holy spirit. Verse eight: If your hand or foot, this is something you, we'll we'll read through, and I'll try not to spend too much time because it's it's a metaphor. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. This, it's graphic because some people, if you've never read this Bible before, if somebody preached this behind a pulpit while I'm reading today, it could really mess with your head. But it's a metaphor. Obviously, he's not saying to cut your hand, but he, he's trying to cut to your heart and get get us to realize that how serious this is Um to stay away from the ways of the world. So he's basically saying, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lamed or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet. If your hands, if you decided to use those hands instead of for working and making a living and taking care of your family and following Christ and you choose to use your hands to steal from from your neighbor or steal and to um, like some, you could learn from the ways of the world, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's what it's saying. You, you're better off to chop that hand off just to bring the reality and the graphic nature of that. If you think about it and trying to get through our thick heads to, um, don't follow the ways of the world. 
um, verse 9, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life, to have life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell. It's like your what you let into your eye gate, if you think it's okay to, like if you're a married man or it's just a man looking at pornography and stuff like that, and it takes you to a place where you would have, uh, you know, um, um, have an affair on your your spouse or something like that. You you're better off. He gets graphic again about his work because this is in red letters. This is Jesus speaking, trying to teach people right from wrong. How are you going to enter into heaven and how you're not going to enter into heaven? So that's why he's saying if you're rather you're be better off to have one eye, but you know, enter into heaven, then two eyes, and, and, you're, and, and be hellbound, basically what he's saying. Uh, chapter 18, verse 10, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now he's talking about the little ones again, even after all that teaching and trying to shock you into reality how serious this is what you do with your hands and your and what you use your eyes for it is it for worldly things or is it for heavenly things it's kind of it's really what he's trying to teach us here verse 11 for the son of man has come to save that which was lost and that's what he's trying to do that if you're reading that and you think man this is too out there for me i can't stomach this i i you know and you're 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 thinking actually chopping a hand off plucking an eye and all these things no he it's just that's jesus's approach to show us how important it is to 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 live for for his glory follow the scriptures and love your neighbors as yourself work with your hands or you shall not you know you shall not eat you know it's like it's just the the importance of how of of how are you what are you doing with this life remember early on we're going to be accountable for this life that we've lived and that's what he's that's how the scripture started you know um what like what does it profit you to have these riches if you did it in a in a um unworthy manner or you've you've you're you say you're healthy and you're strong and you have good eyes say what did you do with this these that that those strong hands and arms and that good vision that you were granted what did you do with it you that that's really where he ended up with this um Okay, I just had to check the time, guys. Um, okay, let me move on to verse. Thir- uh, we're in chapter eighteen, verse thirteen. And if he should find it, as surely I say to you, he rejoice. Okay, let me back up one. I'm sorry. I'll go. I'll start at eleven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go into the mountains to seek that one that is straying? And if he could find it, as surely I say to you, he rejoices more over than that for that one sheep than over the ninety nine that did not go astray. It's talking about the lost. It's somebody that doesn't have their their salvation and doesn't know the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's it's um now you notice how this story we I hope you you're, you've kept up pretty good. And now we're he's even after he's used a child as an example of of the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And now he's talking about the lost, talking about the people who don't know Christ. And and that's really should catch our attention because what is why why is this in these words for us to read? Um Jesus isn't here today. He is in our hearts and in spirit, but we are we are the temple of God. We are the hands and feet for Jesus. So now that's where you got to look at this um you know, to leave the ninety nine for the one that's lost, and somebody in your your family or in your workplace, or um, that that's that one that has strayed and don't doesn't know Jesus and doesn't have their salvation. That's the that's the lost. 
Um, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you have gained your brother. If you know somebody that's in sin and you just you approach them, even in a private or, a, or just off to the side and, and make them aware of this sin, which is going to lead them to salvation. Teach them about repentance, because that's really salvation is a repentance of sin. And but how do you how do you? How do you have that sin paid for? Because, you know, the penalty for sin is death. It's kind of what it's talking about. It's almost like a um, message of salvation here. But if he will not hear with, I'm sorry, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word, word would be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he re refuses to hear the church, let him, uh, let it, be known like a heathen and a tax collector. He, you can only, it's almost like you, if you can't reach someone with this gospel, the gospel of salvation, which we're going to get to in a minute, um, you, you, God is actually saying in his word, you can move on. You, you've, you've tried three different approaches to lead somebody to Christ. And if they don't, if they made up their mind, they're not going to receive Christ, then you move on because there's other lost sheep. This is how I receive that. I sh Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now, that that's a, almost a whole other teaching within itself, guys. I'm not going to get too f I'm going to stop right there um, in chapter 18, verse 18. And um, like always, I want to talk to you a little bit about the... Um, the sinners, well, the, the prayer of salvation, because really the whole Bible leads to your salvation if you read it that way and understand. Because think about it in Genesis when it talked of Adam and Eve and, and they they fell into sin by eating of the tree, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which brought sin into the world. And think about it. All through the Bible, it's leading us to Christ <laughs> through the Old Testament, the coming Messiah. And to the New Testament, uh, where Jesus was was brought into the world by the um, the Son of the Heavenly Father through a, a, a birth of uh, from a Virgin Mary, which we just celebrated. Um, the whole message, the gospel, the good news. Well, the entire Bible leads us to a, a place of salvation. And um, and what and the the meaning of salvation is to be saved. Basically, it's just being forgiven of your sins, which we received with the fall of man, man when Adam and Eve sinned, and being forgiven of that sin and being granted eternal life with the Lord. Guys, this thing, this this stay here on this planet is not long. Whether you die of a young age of one or 100, it's still, when you look at eternity, it's just a small window of time in your life on this earth. So that's why it's so important to understand salvation. Um, and that's why I always touch on it at the end of when I uh, finish speaking, because um, eternity, you're either, you're, there's, eternity's not going to stop because you don't believe. You're going to enter into a place, eternity and hell, which is a gnashing of wailing and gnashing of teeth and, and never ending uh, darkness and fire and brimstone, all these things that that's the other, that's the other eternity. We're, what we're, what we're here to preach and, and, and Jesus is Lord is the, the, the eternity with the heavenly father in heaven, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no, no more pain. And then you've got to make up your mind, whether you're going to believe in, in Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior and, you got to realize that there, um, this isn't. We're not talking about religion here. Whether you just opt out, like, well, I don't, I don't believe in uh, this Jesus stuff and this this religion. It's not religion in any way, shape, or form. It's eternity. You're talking about everlasting life with the heavenly Father, or everlasting darkness with the devil himself and in hell. I hate to lay it out there that way on a Christmas 
holiday season and heading into the new year, but I feel it's my place since I've got the privilege of staying behind a microphone and a camera to put this out there, the importance of salvation. And basically, I'll just break it down. When you get in your quiet place, or even if you go to an altar call in a church and you know you've made up your mind, man, even this guy, this biker guy on uh, from <laughs> Jesus is Lord Church, I something he said stirred something up in me, and now I better you you feel like you got to look into this. You, it's as simple as knowing that you have sinned. No, and basically, sin is just you. You're li- you've done something out of the will of God, something that's just, it doesn't matter how small it is. Sin is sin, and any sin at all can't enter into heaven. So you want that sin forgiven. Basically, that's all. So just start out by knowing, okay, I know I have sinned. So now you're saying I'm a sinner. But then you got to believe, and remember, you can't enter into heaven with any sin. So basically, you just got to believe in your heart that God the Father, our Creator, sent His Son, Jesus, to die for your sins. So basically, Jesus is dying in your place for your sins. You, the penalty for sin is death. Well, death is the separation from God. So if you don't believe that Jesus died for your sins, that you are going to die for those sins at, at the end of this, when, when Jesus is returned. Without your salvation, you're going to enter, in, enter into hell. So you, but you got to get this in your thinking and understand it. I'm trying to make it as simple as I can. So you, you, you just from your heart, you, you're saying to the heavenly father, Lord, I, I believe that you sent your son, Jesus to die in my place for my sins. And you're, and you're going to receive that forgiveness. And you're just going to basic, and you got to remember the, and, and learn this and, and understand it that, but Jesus was raised again from the dead. So he, death could not hold him. So you got to believe that too. You got to, you got to believe that Jesus died in your place for your sins, but you, but the, but, but that death could not hold him. So he was raised again. You got to believe this and understand it in your heart. Then you're going to believe all these things and speak this out and confess it. Then you're going to, to then you're going to tell the heavenly father, make a promise. I promise to live my life for you from this day forward. And thank you for saving me in Jesus name. I pray and don't try to be this perfect person. You, you, you're instantly not going to be perfect and you're going to be struggling with the flesh until the return of Christ when we get our new glorified bodies and 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 we're we're made new again in in the when we enter into heaven but as we're here you're going to be it's going to be a spiritual battle between your flesh and the spirit that's in you just basically when you stumble you get weak in the flesh you just be quick to repent change your ways ask for forgiveness and God is just to forgive you. Don't make this so hard on yourself where you think, man, I don't know if I can hack being a, or handle being a Christian. No, you, you keep, you, God knows our shortcomings and, and our weaknesses. That's why he sent Jesus to die for these sins. And the world, worldly things are, 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 are is going to bring forth sin. So that's why it's a good idea to get a Bible, stay in the Word, go to church on, you know, at least once a week on a Sunday morning or whatever schedule fits you the best, because there's always Jesus is Lord here. We're, we have three services a day, seven days a week. You've got to find a church that you're, you feel like you're being fed at and stuff like that. But, um, Guys, like always, I really appreciate your all taking the time out of your day to watch these services we do here. At Jesus is Lord, and um, we're coming up on the new year. I hope everybody had a blessed Christmas and celebrated the birth of Christ. And and I and um, if you want to make a new New Year's resolution, and don't break this one like a lot of people do when you make these new use New Year resolution. Seek Christ. Go after your salvation. Go after the Word of God and. And make 2024 of the greatest year of your whole life, because if you have eternal life with the Lord, it doesn't get any better than that. So, guys, I'll see you next Wednesday. God bless.